All right, so today is going to be a review day. Um, it would probably help if you guys could see this. Uh, I have already been asked to look at one of the web work problems, so that's what we're going to kick things off with. Um, whatever we don't get to today, we will also have another review session on Monday for the exam. Um, Alia, could you remind me which of these questions it is? Four, okay. So this is genuinely one of the more difficult web work problems. Um, so I anticipate multiple of you will struggle with it as soon as you bother trying to do it. Um, so I figured we'd be nice and just take a crack at it. Why is the screen? Oh, because I didn't turn the system on. That's how far I have to All right, so let me redraw the circuit really quickly. So we have a source voltage, which I believe is unspecified, which makes this slightly more difficult. Um, then we have our capacitor here in parallel with our source. We're trying to find the value of C. Um, we have a 5.5 ohm resistance, at least for my set of numbers. And then we have our load. And we are told that our load draws a certain amount of, in my case at least, it's apparent power, 12.6 um, kVA at a power factor of 0 0.6 lagging. Um, the current flowing through our load has a magnitude of 22 amps RMS. And what other information? Uh, we want our new power factor to be 0 0.94 lagging. Actually, that F shouldn't be a subscript. My apologies. And we are also told that the system operates at a frequency of 60 hertz. Um, so just to remind you guys, our equation for C is P old times the tangent of theta old minus the tangent of theta nu divided by omega times the magnitude of the voltage drop across the capacitor squared. So we don't presently know P old or theta old or the magnitude of the voltage drop across the capacitor. Um, omega, while we're at it, is just going to be 2 pi plus you times 60 hertz or 120 pi radians per second, theta nu will be the inverse cosine of 0 0.94, which is 19.948 degrees. So we've got to figure out how to get these three other pieces of information. Okay. We are going to approach this fairly similarly to how we approached our uh, example problem on Wednesday's class meeting. So 
um, I can say that the complex power absorbed by my load is going to be 12.6 kVA with an angle of the inverse cosine of 0 0.6 So 12.6 angle inverse cosine of 0 0.6 gives me 12.6 with an angle of 53.130 degrees kilovolt amperes. Um, The complex power absorbed by my resistance, so S 5.5, is going to be the magnitude of IL quantity squared times 5.5 ohms. Um, so that'll be 22 squared times 5.5 looks like 2.662 angle zero degrees volt amperes. And so the complex power supplied by my voltage source is just going to be S load plus S 5.5, which I get to be 14.356 with an angle of 44.599. Degrees kilovolt amperes, or in rectangular form, ten point two 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 plus J ten point zero eight kilovolt amperes. So, um, what pieces of information have I just figured out? Yep, so P old is going to be 10.222 kilowatts. And theta old is going to be 44.599 degrees. From here and here, respectively. So the last piece of information that we need to determine is the voltage drop across our capacitor, which happens to be our source voltage, right? So, anyone have any ideas on how we might do that? So we already added the powers together, right? Um, if we divide by the current, so let's let's think about this here. What do we need? Do we need all of it or do we just need the magnitude? Because I think we just need the magnitude, right? So I would argue, since we know the complex power supplied by our voltage source, um, the apparent power of our voltage source is this 14.356 kilovolt amperes. We know the magnitude of the current that's leaving. And because apparent power is simply the magnitude of the voltage times the magnitude of the current, that'll let us solve for the magnitude of the voltage very easily. So um, 
the magnitude of our voltage Vs should be the magnitude of SVS divided by the magnitude of IL. So 14.356, um, so let me say, say this is Y. And I'm going to divide this by 0 0.022 um, instead of 22 so that my answer is going to come out in volts instead of kilovolts. Although it being in kilovolts wouldn't necessarily be bad. Um, I get 652.547 volts RMS. And now recognizing that this is the exact same thing as the magnitude of the voltage drop across the capacitor, sorry, not squared, I have all of the different pieces of information to plug into my power factor correction expression. Um, obviously, you guys' numbers are going to be different, but the process is here. All right, what's next? Questions about one of the practice exams. Sure. Um, so, so what's the 2019 exam? Let me open it up real quick. Yeah, you'll kind of continue with Okay. So let me let me explain something. Um, the exam that you guys are going to have is not going to be cumulative. That being said, we made the transition to non-cumulative exams within the last two years or so. Okay. So most of the exams prior to that are cumulative and only the last third of the material on that test is fair game for this test. Okay, there is an exam that is specifically listed as non-cumulative um, that is fairly representative of the types of questions that I may ask you. I do want to caution you that that exam is 35 question long. Your exam will not be 35 questions long. Uh, because I was told by our former dean that I am a jerk and was making the tests too long. So it, it'll be, he didn't say it like that, but yeah. Um, so um, it'll be the exact same format as you have been accustomed to with the previous exams in this class, 25 questions, the first five of which are theory questions. Then we move along into analysis questions and all of that kind of stuff. Uh, the material that will be covered on this last exam stems from op amps all the way through power factor correction. Um, there will be a couple of problems on there, literally asking you just to effectively use your calculator correctly. Um, so just simple, yeah. Do, exactly right. So, um, so like there will be questions regarding the complex number review. There will also be questions regarding the sinusoidal review. So like the leading and lagging kind of things that you had for your homework sets and all that kind of good stuff. So everything that we have done from op amps and on is fair game. Uh, I don't know how many of you all have noticed this, but there is an equation sheet available online. That equation sheet will be provided to you with the exam. I believe I've already warned you, I did not make out the equation sheet, nor do I have any intention to correct the equation sheet. So you are using it at your own risk because I do not believe it's necessary, but I will provide it to you. Fair. Um, number 17 on the, the 2019 winter one. I'm hoping those don't exist anymore because 17 and 18 are like the big nasty circuits that are asking for. So let's know. see. So winter 2019, you said exam three. There's some random stuff on here. Yep, definitely don't need to worry about that. Which problem did you say? Uh, 17 and 18. I just wanted to make sure those are. The... Nope. Well, this is just a DC circuit. Will not be on here. Like, those are the varieties that you said we don't do anymore because they're just gnarly and ass. For... Yeah. Well, this one explicitly would be nodal analysis, but yeah. Right. Because I labeled all of the nodal voltages. And then this reference thing right here is just your ground. But anyway. All right. So, questions about stuff that will actually be on the test. Hit me with something. Yes.
Could you speak up, please? I'm old. Fall 2018. 15 and 16. All right. Fifteen and sixteen. Okay. Um, so I personally would do current division to get the answer to fifteen. Um, so let me do that up here. That is exactly right. So I C would be two angle 30 degrees amperes times. So now I have this big thing on the right. Um, so that looks like negative J 15 ohms in series with parallel combination of six and J three. Ooh, what the hell happened there? That was a noise. Um, and then I would put that in my calculator and I'm going to assume, well, never mind. I was going to assume it's going to give me the answer in bold, but I'm just going to be lazy and say, put that in your calculator and assume the right answer is there. Uh, but that's the process that I would use to solve for that particular one. Uh, so for number 16, um, I would then use Ohm's law and say that VL is going to be negative IC times the parallel combination of six and J3 Is that coming from above us? Oh, well, I'm about to go tell them to shut the hell up because they're annoying me. Um, so that's how I would solve 16 is just using Ohm's law once I know I see. That being said, another way to potentially do this would be, <clears throat> excuse me, to perform a source transformation on this thing. Um, and then you could do voltage division to find VL first, and then just Kirchhoff's voltage law and Ohm's law to find IC. Um, yeah, that's another way that you could do it, but I think current division and then Ohm's law is slightly more efficient because you don't have to do that step of source transformation. Uh, yeah. What next? Well, sure. All right. <clears throat> so I want to explicitly state, I won't put anything like this on your test. That being said, this isn't that hard. This is more of a theory question that happens to involve some math than it is an analysis question. Okay. So, um, think about how to explain this. We want this network to look like a purely real impedance. So effectively what that means is that we need the inductor and the capacitor to look like an open circuit. 
because if the inductor and the capacitor combined look like an open circuit, all we would see would be the five ohm resistance and we would have a purely real impedance. So what is the impedance of an inductor in parallel with a capacitor? So Z would be J omega L times one over J omega C divided by J omega L plus one over J omega C. And I'm gonna multiply by J omega C over J omega C to get rid of the fractions inside of my fractions, right? So this guy is gonna cancel this guy. This guy is gonna cancel this guy. And what I'm left with is J omega L um, divided by J squared times omega squared LC. If I want this to look like an open circuit, that means Oh, actually, um, plus one. What's J squared? Negative one, right? So this is going to look like J omega L divided by one minus omega squared LC. All right, so to make my denominator look like, excuse me, to make this uh, combination look like an open circuit, that means my denominator needs to be zero so that my numerator will be infinitely larger than my denominator, right? So I need one minus omega squared LC to be equal to zero, which happens when omega is equal to one over the square root of LC. And then I would plug those numbers in and get a result. Um, for those of you that are in electrical engineering, what I have done here is I have just determined the resonant frequency of this circuit, which the resonant frequency is defined to be um, the frequency at which the impedance is purely real. And for any RLC circuit where it just has a single resistance, capacitance, and inductance, it will always have this value, regardless of if it's a series. RLC circuit, a parallel RLC circuit, or some blend of the two. It's always just going to be that. But you guys don't know that yet because you haven't had circuits three. It depends. Are you trying to build a resonator? If so, oscillate your thing at the resonant frequency. Are you not trying to build a resonator? Stay the hell away from the resonant frequency. <laughs> yeah, where things shake themselves apart. Right. So that is a big, big thing in electrical engineering is you want to design to make sure that your excitation frequency electrically isn't the same as the mechanical resonant frequency, or you will shake the thing that you're powering apart. Um, one thing on the equation piece, it has the impedance of a capacitor listed as negative J uh, or, or negative J over omega C. Mm -hmm. is, that, is that such a fair thing? Okay. Yeah. One over J is the same thing as negative J in the numerator. And I've done that, I think, three or four times at this point. Okay, that makes sense. I had to, I had to remember what J is. Yep. That's really All right, what next? I kind of stopped talking. I'm sorry. Number 11. So C here is a exponential form complex number um, whose angle is being expressed in pi radians. So in a less asinine way to show it, um, this would be seven angle negative 0 0.5 pi times 180 degrees over pi is seven angle 
Um, so let's see, the pi's cancel out, negative 90 degrees. If we wanted to have it in a form that we could input or store in our calculator. So anytime I give you an angle and it doesn't contain a degree sign, it's in radians, just to be real clear about that. And then at this point, like for this problem, I'm explicitly expecting you to store A, B, and C correctly in your calculator and then just make it do that. Or I guess I underlined too much, but yeah. What's next? What do you mean by that specific? The only thing that you need to remember, I would say, okay. is how to convert from exponential form into polar form, because that's the only thing your calculator can't do for you. Right? So the exponential form of a complex number and the polar form of a complex number literally contain identical information. It's just expressed slightly differently. So here, all I did was I took the magnitude and I put it as the magnitude. And then I took the angle and I put it in the angle spot. And then I just had to convert it from radians to degrees. Correct. So, yeah, so the J, yeah, don't, don't put that in there. Yep, J times the angle, 100% correct. Yeah. So actually, and let me explicitly write that. So um, that's your transformation. So throw away the J. What's next? Fun. You're the only one brave enough to ask. That's on them. What up? 30? Um, let's see. So we know that the magnitude of S is 35 kVA. We also know that the imaginary part of S is negative 20 kVA. And I'm saying that because I'm given 20 here, but I'm also told that it is supplying. Um, I want the power factor, right? So power factor is defined to be the ratio of the average power divided by our magnitude. Um, so we have our magnitude. Now we need to find the average power. So the magnitude of S is the square root of p squared plus q squared, and we have q. So p will just be the square root of the magnitude of s squared minus q squared. Which would be... Uh, Five squared minus 20 squared is 5 root 33. Then I'm going to divide that by 35. I get 33 square root of 7. Hold on. Oh, 
square root of 33 over 7, 0 0.821. And it is 0 0.821 leading. So let me put this here. 5 square root of 33 over 35 is 0 0.821. The reason the answer is leading is because we were explicitly told that our reactance was negative. So if we were absorbing 20 kilovars, it would have been 0 0.821 lagging. So just to be clear, um, I'm going to do that every single time. Also, um, let me find a problem. No, what complex power? Like this guy right here. I'm asking you to determine the reactive power absorbed by an impedance. Um, if you will notice, I don't know what the right answer is off the top of my head, but the number 26.923 VAR shows up here, then 26.923 volt amperes, then 26.923 watts, meaning I am very much expecting you to know what the correct unit for reactive power is, which is VARs. That being said, um, I am going to set it up on the grading thing to do partial credit like I did previously um, so that if you get the right number but the wrong unit or the wrong sign as it were which is the case for leading and lagging power factor you won't lose all of the points for that problem just like one and a half points for that problem I'll try to be mildly less of a jerk So just to be clear, reactive power has R in it because those are volt amperes reactive. So I feel like reactive power is an easy one. Um, average power is just the power we've been dealing with all along. So it's in watts. So by process of elimination, apparent power must be volt amperes. Yeah. All right, what's next? All 2020, number four. All right, so which of the loads will have a negative phase angle? Um, this one, this phase angle is negative 90. This one, its phase angle is between 0 and negative 90. And this one, whose phase angle is also between 0 and negative 90. Effectively, it has to have a capacitor if the phase angle is negative. What's next? Actually, before we move on from this one, so um, I don't know if they've shown up on any of the practice tests that I've made available to you guys, but I might do something like this and say, which of the following loads operates at a leading power factor? Which of the following loads operates at a lagging power factor, et cetera? So let me erase these things. Yep, so lagging power factor would be this one. Oh, actually, sorry. Nope, that one, just that one. So the resistor operates at a unity power factor, a power factor of exactly equal to one that is neither leading nor lagging. Capacitor by itself operates at a zero power factor, which is neither leading or lagging. The inductor by itself operates at a zero power factor, which is neither leading or lagging. And these capacitor ones here will operate at a leading power factor, which isn't lagging. So lagging power factor requires a resistor and an inductor. Leading power factor requires a resistor and a capacitor. Any pure element isn't going to operate at a leading or lagging power factor.
What's next? Heaven forbid I make you think. All right, so yep, this one uh, apparently I was not in a good mood. So I'm going to subdivide this thing up into multiple parts. Right. So the effective value, this is a voltage. These things. So V effective is going to be the square root of one over, let's see, this thing has a period of four seconds. times integral from zero to one second of, let's see, so this has a slope of two volts per second. Times time and the intercept is zero. I'm gonna square this whole thing. Then I have the integral from one second to three seconds. Uh, I'm explicitly told what that shape is. So two times T minus two squared quantity squared. Uh, sorry, I forgot my DTs here for my integral. And then the integral from three seconds, four seconds. Uh, my slope for this bit right here is negative two volts per second, sorry. T minus three, because I'm just shifting it over three units and then adding my intercept of two, square that, close this off. While this looks rather daunting and I'm not saying it isn't, we can make our life slightly easier by saying that this thing and the, our first term are the exact same shape so because of symmetry, I can just put a two out front and not have to worry about what that last bit's going on with. And, and at this point, I could just put crap in my calculator. This is significantly more difficult than I've put on any test recently. Not saying it can't be done, because I just did it effectively in three minutes, but that that's pretty mean. Don't remember. I blocked it out. <laughs> yeah. No. Uh, sure. I'm sorry, I couldn't hear you. Probably not. All right. Um, so we have an unknown impedance, and we're trying to find the reactive power absorbed by the load. Um, we're told the voltage drop across the load and the current flowing through the load. So S is just V times I conjugate, um, because we would express this in rectangular form as P plus JQ. Q is the answer.
what's next? So P old is thirty seven kilowatts. Theta old is the inverse cosine of zero point eight seven. So twenty nine point five four one degrees. Uh, and I'm going to store this in my calculator as X. Um, let's see, theta nu is the inverse cosine of 0 0.95. Store that as Y. 18.195. Um, omega is 2 pi times 50 hertz. So that's 100 pi radians per second. And the magnitude of our capacitor voltage is 380 volts RMS. So 37 thousand times the tangent of x minus the tangent of y divided by a hundred right there 100 pi times 380 squared c is 194.150 times 10 to the minus six. So I don't know. Yeah, I'm pretty sure what I did was, uh, I didn't realize it was already in line. I think I did, uh, I counted it at and so I did 37 kilowatt over 27, which is 37. Yeah. Yep. My PO was like 42. Yeah, because it's literally given to you. Yeah. <laughs> So let's look at the units of this thing, right? So C is equal to P old times the tangent of theta old minus the tangent of theta nu divided by omega times the magnitude of the voltage squared, okay? So we have watts in the numerator, which is a volt per amp. In the denominator, we have omega, which is measured in radians per second, when volt squared. So this cancels volt, sorry, you're right, volt times amp which this was about to come out incorrectly anyway, so thank you for that. Volt times an amp. This cancels this guy here. We can move the seconds into the numerator, and so we wind up getting amp seconds per volts times radians. Well, radians is a dimensionless quantity. So an amp second per volt is a farad. So the only time we ever need to convert our angular frequency into a degrees per second frequency is if we're ever evaluating a sinusoidal function at a specific point in time. And we are not doing that here. Nope, tangent is a, yep, it's just a ratio, yep. Mm -hmm.
What's next? Yes, ma'am. Thirty on fall twenty eighteen. Twenty nineteen. Um, let's see, how would I go about doing this? Um, probably voltage divisions. Now, you may be thinking, how the hell is he going to make voltage division work for this thing? I'm going to redraw the circuit real quick in a way that's a little less annoying. Twelve angle zero degrees volts. This impedance. This is. Let me start over. This just looks like garbage. I'm going to call this impedance ZL. I'm going to call this impedance ZR, or literally the left impedance and the right impedance. ZL is just 12 in parallel with J18. ZR is just 16 in parallel with minus J7, right? So VX is just the voltage drop across That impedance ZL. So VX could be given by 12 angle zero degrees volts times ZL over ZL plus ZR using voltage division. Um, to do 31, I'm assuming is find the current. Um, so let me look at the polarities of things here. So I want the positive polarity terminal at the negative sign here. I'm going to call this Vy. I could solve for Vy using voltage division and then Vy divided by negative J7 ohms. So Vy will be negative 12 angle zero ZR over ZL plus ZR. IY is just VY over negative J7 ohms. So even though I drew it like a total jackass, um, recognizing that you can combine those impedances makes this pretty straightforward. And then just rotate the circuit 90 degrees to make it look like we're used to seeing them. Um, you could but you would also need to pay attention to the signs. Um, like if you do KVL around this loop to make sure you get the right sign on it. But yeah, absolutely. I think VY would, uh, with the polarity that we have here would be VX minus 12 instead of the other way around, but yeah. What's next? Yes, ma'am. Fall 2018, 19, and 20. All right. Um, so let's do 19 first. So what's VX by inspection right here? 
we're finding the Thevenin voltage, which is this voltage. What's Vx have to be? Walter, you're nodding your head. So we putting you on front street, bud. What's the voltage drop across anything that isn't part of a closed current carrying network? Zero, right. So if this voltage is zero volts, that means this current source looks like an open circuit. And so V Thevenin is three angle 30. So that guy right there. So that's 19. So for number 20, this is 2018. So now we are going to short that guy out. We're trying to find this current. So I'm going to do KCL at this node. So this current, this current, and this current. Um, so that's going to look like VX minus 3 angle 30 volts over minus J 0 0.5 ohms plus 0 0.5 VX plus VX over J4 is equal to zero. Once we solve for VX, I Norton is just VX divided by J4. What's next? Number 24 for this test. All right, so let's see. This is a current. It is a negative sine function. Um, no, excuse me, a negative cosine function because it's starting at negative one. Let's figure out what omega is, although realistically it doesn't matter, but we'll get to that in a minute. Um, so period for what we're interested in is two, I'm gonna say seconds because I forgot to put units or instead of putting S I put T for whatever dumb reason. That being said, um, when we're calculating omega, we need to look at how long it would take for a full sinusoidal cycle to occur, right? So if we weren't cutting this thing in half and duplicating it over and over again, it would take four seconds for this sinusoidal cycle to repeat itself. Um, omega, I'm gonna call this T prime. Um, so omega is equal to two pi over T prime, two over four, so that's just pi over two. Okay. So cosine pi over two T, no phase angle to speak of. The magnitude is also one. So I effective is going to be one over two seconds times the integral from zero to two seconds of negative cosine pi over two t amps squared dt using my trig identity one over two seconds times the integral from zero to two seconds of um, one half 
plus one half cosine pi t dt. Because I'm integrating over an integer number of periods for this guy right here, right? So this is my double frequency term. So effectively, that's what that guy looks like, except actually it's only one half tall, not one tall, but that doesn't matter. The integral of this thing, as we discussed in class earlier, is zero. Um, so this integral part and this part cancels out, and so it's just going to be 1 over the square root of 2. This is the long way, just to be clear. So as it turns out, and you guys could math excuse me, mathematically prove this if you cared to do so, um, for a sine function, we know that the effective value is the magnitude divided by root 2. That's also true when we have half a sine function and a fourth of a sine function. I'm not sure about eighths. I haven't done the math for eighths. I know it didn't work for a sixth. Yeah. Maybe. I don't know. Yeah. But this is the formal way to do it, and we would see that we would have the square root of one half, which is just one over root two or 0 0.707, blah, blah, blah. The reason why I wasn't particularly concerned about the, the frequency is because um, I know that when it's a sinusoidal function and I square it and then I wind up taking the integral of the double frequency term because I'm integrating over an integer number of periods, that part's going to go to zero. So if I had left this as one over t and then the integral from zero to t, that part was still going to can cancel out either way. Probably. Walker, what up? Number 21. All right. Um, so let's see. So my voltage here at the inverting, or excuse me, the non-inverting input terminal is going to be, let's see, five. Um, this should be milliamps or all of these voltages should be kilovolts because I wasn't paying enough attention to the units. Uh, let's see, five times two is 10. 45 minus 90 is negative 45 degrees volts. So I just took this current, multiplied it by this impedance, got the answer. Yeah, so like all of this current flows through this resistor and then it flows down through that capacitor. Um, we're, when we're trying to find the voltage present at the non-inverting input terminal, that is a nodal voltage with respect to ground, which is the same thing as the voltage drop across that capacitor because it's between that node and ground. Yep. For part 22, we would just apply Kirchhoff's current law. Uh, so we know that this voltage right here is the same thing, 10 angle negative 45 degrees. And then we would just do KCL at this node. So this current plus this current plus this current have to equal zero. The only unknown voltage we don't have is V out. So just one equation, one unknown system, math it up. So just because there's scary capacitors and inductors, we can still treat it like every other op-amp circuit we've seen in this class and do the exact same process. Next.
So let me write out the KCL equation here. Um, so I'm going to be lazy and just call this B minus so that I don't have to write that out over and over again. So we would have B minus divided by 4K plus B minus divided by J3K plus B minus minus B out over negative J5K is equal to zero. And then rearrange stuff correctly, this also be out. So you could move that this minus sign here if you wanted to. Uh, I don't do that kind of stuff because I'll forget what it is I'm trying to do. <laughs> I like I like to deal with the impedances with their respective signs and all that kind of stuff. But if it makes sense to you to do it the other way, do it the other way. Next. All right, so let's wrap it up and then uh, we'll review more on Monday for people that need more review. Yeah. Did I, I literally just did that? All right, so the complex power absorbed by element A is going to be the magnitude of IS squared times ZA, um, which would be the magnitude of SA angle theta S A, we want apparent power, so it's just that. Not really, nope. And just for the sake of argument, if you were trying to find something about B or C, I would use voltage division to find the drop, the voltage drop over B or C. Um, and then I would say that S B is the magnitude of VB squared divided by ZB conjugate, and the mag uh, SC is the magnitude of VC squared divided by ZC conjugate. That would be the fastest way for me to solve for any of those things. Um, with VB and VC solved using voltage division, Although now that I'm thinking about it, it might be just as easy. Actually, it would be easier. Let me scratch all this. I've had 10 seconds to think about it. Yep. Let's call this current IBC. Uh, put a squiggle on it. So IBC would just be VS divided by ZB plus ZC. And then now we could use this exact same style of relationship to solve for all of the complex powers. Yep. So that's actually slightly easier. Not that the other way was difficult, but that's easier. Forgetting to square your signal of interest when you're calculating the effective value is a thing I see very, very, a mistake I see made very commonly. Um, not using the units for the different parts of the complex power correctly. Um, mixing up leading and lagging power factors. Those are all the low hanging fruit kind of things that I see students make mistakes on regularly. All right.